So you'll have a 25 minute talk. OK, thanks, Faye. So I'm going to talk a little bit today on some work that <coughs> I've been doing with the land surface models and trying to include some additional processes that might help us in addressing some of the temperature biases that we've been seeing over the central US. So <clears throat> this is work that I'm doing here at, at RAL, but also Fei is involved in <coughs> Shanghai, who I don't know if he is here is involved. And we have a collaborator in Spain who has been working a lot with this groundwater model I'll be talking about. <coughs> so. <coughs> Somebody took my water. Um, so there's been some recent effort here. Uh, Roy talked about this a little bit yesterday. Some recent effort to conduct some CONUS regional climate simulations at this convection permitting scale over this general domain right here. And so <clears throat> these war simulations are really four kilometer. Um, they're using spectral nudging. Uh, we're using the NOAA MP LSM there for 13 years. They were summarized in Shanghai's paper here that was written last year. Uh, and it was a follow on study to some work that, that Roy had done previously, Roy and the rest of us had done previously. But one of the issues that stood out for us <coughs> was that even with spectral nudging, spectral nudging helped the problem, but it didn't solve it in that uh, the temperature bias really increases throughout the summer. So you can see here. This is a kind of circling this region of interest where we go from April through to July, August, uh, September, where you can see this warm bias kind of building up in the central part of the US. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then, <clears throat> so Roy saw this and said, Faye, you need to solve this problem. And then Faye saw this and said, Mike, you need to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around and no one was there. So <laughs> it became my problem. So, <clears throat> so what, we've, what we did was uh, focused on this region of interest and looked at um, a kind of a reduced domain, again at the four kilometer. It's basically a subset of that larger domain <clears throat> with no spectral nudge. So we removed the sort of cheating that we were doing to remove the, the warm bias um, and looked at the summer of 2012 for these simulations. And so what we see here is that you know this is, again, uh, just proof that we were kind of uh, reproducing that bias in the central part of the US. So we go from April and May and June, July, August, and you see that warm bias starting to form and intensify over the central part of the US. OK, and so what we did here was uh, we did these simulations. I'm going to focus on this region here to do a little bit of analysis of some simulations. And so we see that um, we're going to look at precipitation uh, coming from a radar gauge based product called Stage 4. Uh, it's a four kilometer product. Um, it's, month, it's hourly, but we're converting it to monthly for these comparisons. And then we're also looking at the modus evapotranspiration, so comparing our latent heat flux to this gridded. Uh, evapor evapotranspiration product. OK, and so this is what the results looked like for this April through August. And so what you see here, the stage four precipitation here is in blue. And then um, with the NOAA MP runs in WARF are in red. So what you can see is that there's a, you know, there's a low bias in precipitation throughout the early part of the summer. But then when you get to July, the precipitation almost is gone in Wharf, and you know it recovers a little bit in August, but nowhere near what you're getting at the end of the of the summer season for observed precipitation. The evapotranspiration shows kind of a similar result in that you get. I mean, they're obviously coupled. You need water in order to um, get any latent heat flux. But <coughs> you see here, this is the modus in blue, and the the Wharf runs in red. How you know, as the summer builds up, you get more latent heat flux. Then in July and August, this latent heat flux in the model is reduced. And it's much lower, probably about 50% of what at least the MODIS uh, satellite product is showing. So what we did was, OK, are we missing some processes that might be important in the land surface model? And so this is showing, oh, welcome, Roy. So this is uh, 
the default <laughs> NOAA MP land surface model uh, in WARF uses a two meter soil column, okay? So this is kind of showing, this is the four layers of the model and, the, and the, this is down to two meters. And so what you have here, this is kind of the water budget components where you've got precipitation coming in, you've got a latent heat flux here, you got a surface runoff and you have a subsurface runoff. And this subsurface runoff is, just leaves the model, okay? So this is a drainage out of the bottom of the model and it is assumed to go to like a river network or something. And so, um, so what we looked at was, okay, this is, if you look at this same region, this is the depth to the water table in this region. And so this is going you know, down very deep. But if you talk, look at these green areas, dark green areas are, are within about 10 meters of the surface. And so there's a, cons there's a consistent you know, uh, consistency in the location of the warm bias region with some of, this region, some of these regions here that have a relatively high water table near the surface. And you can see even in this, um, in this simulation where you can capture like uh, within the groundwater, you capture like river valleys. This is uh, in Nebraska and things like that. And so, you know, um, we were gonna test here the addition of a ground, some groundwater representation in NOAA MP. And so, uh, like I said before, NOAA MP, the default uses this free drainage lower boundary condition. Uh, and then what we have here is this new option that's a 1D interaction between the soil and the aquifer below, but then also has horizontal aquifer transport, at least at the water table depth to transfer water. And so I won't go over all of this you know, completely in detail, but just to show, uh, you know, this is the mass balance basically for the aquifer in that the change in the aquifer uh, storage with time is basically due to three factors. Um, one of them is this, uh, the communication between the aquifer and the soil above. The other one is the lateral flow, so the lateral components between the neighboring cells, and then this river um, connectivity term that just is sending that water, some of the water where the uh, aquifer is up to the surface to into the river system. And so what that looks like, you know, in cartoon form is that we've basically taken, you know, the NOAA MP model and added this down here at the bottom, which is you know, there's this additional soil layer, and but then there's also this interaction with the aquifer so that we don't have this sort of just free drainage loss term at the bottom. Uh, we've got a little bit of an added uh, storage dimension down here. And so what does that look like? Um, from a recharge perspective. So recharge meaning this is positive. Uh, the positive numbers here are when the water is going from the soil above down to the aquifer. And so what you can see here is that this is the free drainage model and that you just have this sort of steady, this is a region that's averaged over the central part of the US, but you always have a positive loss term from the um, from the NOAA MP model with the free drainage lower boundary condition. But what you see here in the blue line is that you get a loss until about June, about July, and then the slope of this line turns negative, which means that the water is actually going from the aquifer below up into the active soil layers. And so, um, so this is kind of the, an additional source of water that we were you know, potentially interested in trying to capture. And so when we added, um, these, this groundwater into the NOAA MP model and re-ran these four kilometer simulations, what we see is that here's the precipitation now in black. Uh, I just added it in black uh, relative to what was here before. So what you see is that uh, there's increased precipitation throughout this central part of the US. But one of the things that we see at the end of the summer season is that the precipitation is really well captured in July and it's reducing that bias in August substantially here. So this is, uh, again, the ET results for that same period. And what you see is that, you know, the ET is much larger throughout most of the, uh, throughout all of the months relative to the no AMP without groundwater. And we are actually probably doing, we're a little bit aggressive here on some of these June and July months, but by August we're, we're doing pretty well. So, 
you know, we're capturing more precipitation, which is allowing us to evaporate more, but I think we're also tapping some of that water from below to be able to evaporate more at the end of the summer season. So if we look at then how this, um, how this uh, temperature bias evolves now over the central part of the US, we see these lower simulations have groundwater included and the upper simulations don't have groundwater included. So this is in April, these, so this top row here will be the same figures that you saw in uh, the earlier part of the presentation. So you can see here that as the summer progresses where that warm bias intensified, uh, we're actually doing a pretty good job of controlling and that warm bias and having a good temperature simulation throughout the summer months here. So we're happy about these results. We thought they looked pretty good. Now, I actually, when we put this groundwater model into the system, uh, maybe three years ago, I wrote a paper uh, in 2015, and we looked at something, a, a similar sort of approach here. We did, these were 30 kilometer simulations, and we did them over a, you know, a normal year, a dry year, or sorry, a wet year and a dry year just to see how the model would perform, and you know, this is our domain. I mean, again, it's a coarse resolution. And we compared against a lot of surface stations, uh, so we were looking at temperature uh, results as well. So what you see here in this table is that um, this is no AMP without groundwater and with groundwater in the spring and the summer months. And so what you see is that the day, you know, one thing that's interesting is that the daytime bias um, is that the Groundwater doesn't have a lot of an effect here for the spring, but it has about regionally average, this is again is like the central part of the US. Regionally average, the effect was maybe a half a degree up to maybe like a degree um, for, the, for the warm bias across the central part of the US. Okay, so, you know, so there are regional biases, you know, maybe up to a degree and a half I'm writing here, okay. So these, um, and sorry, I actually, didn't have the uh, scale on here, but these these differences are more on the order of like five degrees Celsius. So, you know, they're very large relative to what we saw in these 30 kilometer runs. And so, you know, that was kind of interesting that, you know, are we dealing with some scale dependencies for this, um, for this groundwater model? And so this is just a, a simple scatter plot showing, these are the depths to the water table in the four kilometer simulations so as you go across here. These are the 30 kilometer depth to water table. So this is like, this is a sort of an input that you have to put into the model. Uh, how far down is the water table uh, over these individual grids? And so what you see is that, at least what we found is that you've got to have the water table within about five to 10 meters in order for it to really be actively communicating with the, the, the soil above. And so what you see here in the scatter plot is that in the 30 kilometer simulations, there's very few pixels that have, very few grid points that have um, groundwater within five meters of the surface. And, but when you look at the four kilometer simulations, you have a significant number of them that are within four meters of the surface. And so um, this is primarily just an averaging issue, right? We've got you know, this groundwater uh, depth to groundwater data set is developed on a one kilometer grid. And so you barely are averaging out a lot of these river valleys and things when you go to a 30 kilometer simulation. So we wanted to then, um, you know, explore this a little bit further. And this is some ongoing work. And by ongoing, I mean, I just did them last weekend. So, um, you know, these are some preliminary results here for some of these scale dependencies that we're looking at. but. So this is the experiment. We're basically doing a wharf, a nested wharf simulation where we've got a 27 kilometer grid uh, over this region here, and then a nine kilometer grid here and a three kilometer grid here. And we're gonna analyze the results in the central part of the US to look at what the scale effects are here in these kind of cascading uh, simulations, okay? And I'm looking again at this summer of 2012. Um, in using the same physics really in all the simulations and I'm using a scale aware uh, convection scheme. So, um, uh, so even on the three kilometer, there's a scale aware convection scheme running. Um, 
So again, this is uh, the same plot as before, but this is really like the depth of the water table. So these are, you know, this is the region that we're sort of interested in seeing what the effect is. And so uh, like that scatter plot that I just showed, I throw it together in a quick cumulative distribution of de the depth of the groundwater in these three scales. So the 27, 9, and 3 in black, red, and, and uh, blue. And so what you can see here is that the blue, so this is depth of, depth of the groundwater, and this is the cumulative uh, distribution. So the blue, the blue lines, at least down in this region where you're close to the surface, and actually I have a, a zoomed in picture of this section right here that goes down to 10 meters. Um, what you see here is that if you look at, again, like five meters down, where the water table's five meters down or less, uh, you see that there's about 40% of the pixels in the three kilometer run, but only probably, you know, 25% of them or so in the, in the 27 kilometer run. So there's a significant um, scale dependency here in where you are, how many pixels you have that have groundwater close to the surface. Okay, so, and it's interesting. So these are, you know, this is the, this is basically the, the 27, this is the nine, and this is the three. So you see, you know, there's a, you know, we have one, if there's one kilometer of data here. So, you know, we re, we're gonna reach a, a limit at some point, but um, it's not really a linear effect for, for how many pixels you have uh, close to the surface. So what are some of the results? Well, this is the precipitation with no groundwater. And I'm gonna have to explain these lines because they're hard to see. Uh, but what you see is that uh, the three kilometer simulation here, this is without groundwater, actually shows the lowest precipitation. And the nine and the 27 kilometer runs, which are here, show, um, have a similar total precip, but it's actually a little bit more than the, um, than the three kilometer run. So this is the accumulated precipitation over the central part of the US throughout the simula simulation. So if we add the groundwater in, this is showing the groundwater results here, and this line here, the lower line here is actually the 27 kilometer runs, and the three and the nine kilometer runs actually have slightly more precipitation um, than the coarser simulation. So adding the groundwater, um, you know, there's a slight bit of a difference here. I mean, we need to probably run some more simulations to have some confidence in this, but at least these show that, you know, the higher resolution runs with groundwater actually producing more precipitation. So if we combine those two slides, what you see is that um, all the groundwater simulations have an increased precipitation relative to no groundwater uh, when you compare the same uh, simulations with the same horizontal resolution. So the difference that means then, because you know the, the results they showed here are kind of flipped, right? Th this one has the 27 with the least, this one has a three with the least, so that means that the three kilometer simulation actually has the biggest groundwater effect, uh, goes from you know here to here. And some of these coarser resolution runs don't have nearly, the 27 kilometer run doesn't have that much of a groundwater effect, okay? Which is kind of what we had hoped to see anyway with this uh, scale dependent result. So what, is, what are the observations? Well, lucky for me, since I made these plots yesterday, the, uh, Stage four precipitation accumulated here is um, shows you know the results with the groundwater in the higher resolution actually perform better relative to these stage four observations. So um, you know again we're running some more years of this to make sure that this is a robust result, but it's encouraging at least. Um, so spatially, what does this look like? Where the August precipitation. Um, Increase with groundwater in both resolutions. So what this is, is this is, these are no groundwater runs over here. Top row is nine kilometers, this is three kilometers. This is with the groundwater, and this is the, um, the observations over here, so with the stage four. So what you can see in both of these simulations is that you get sort of an increased precipitation in this region here when you add the groundwater. I think we're still probably missing some precipitation over in the northwest part of this domain, but you know, uh, at least the results are, are fairly encouraging. So just also, um, you know, one of the things we started doing this for was the, uh, the warm bias, right? So 
This is also a comparison now with um, METAR stations. So this is individual stations. Um, these are the biases. So red is a, is a warm bias. And so you can see without groundwater, there's a warm bias you know, across this whole region. With groundwater, there's not that much of an effect. This is in the core simulation, so the 27 kilometer simulation. There's a little bit of, there's a very little effect of the groundwater on these simulations uh, in August. And so, but what you see is that if you go down to, this is the nine kilometer simulations, is that the bias actually increases without groundwater. So if I go back again, you can see the, the dots get larger, right? And so the groundwater effect actually gets larger. So there's actually an effect to the groundwater here in lowering that warm bias. And if we go down to the three kilometer runs, we see kind of the same thing. The, actually, the bias slightly increases in the in the uh, no groundwater runs, but the reduction of the warm bias actually increases for adding groundwater in the, in the three kilometer runs. And so just to try to illustrate that a little bit more, this is showing for July and for August, but this is the, it's the bias reduction by, from adding groundwater. And so blue here is good. It means that the bias is reduced from, and since it's almost all warm bias, it means that you're reducing the warm bias. But what you can see here is that these are the one kilometer, 27 kilometer, uh, sorry, domain one, one uh, 27 kilometer runs. And that you see is that the effect, the reduction in July and August is actually quite small. Uh, this is the mean of the domain, so it's maybe, you know, point a quarter of a degree or something like that. But if we look at <clears throat> domain two, which is the nine kilometer runs, the effect of the groundwater is actually much more significant over this region uh, in reducing the warm bias by on the order of a degree on average over this whole region. Um, and again, it increases even more for the three kilometer simulations where this is now again like about a degree and a half or so. So this is, you know, we're seeing a little bit of difference in the, the effect between some of the earlier simulations we did, we did and these simulations, although locally this is, you know, these bias reductions are larger than, you know, three degrees. So, you know, over here, we're kind of, we're kind of averaging some of this stuff out by including some of these other um, areas here. But this is basically uh, my conclusions that, you know, the inclusion of the groundwater uh, seems to be beneficial in addressing some of this late season warm bias in the central U.S. And I think it's, you know, one of the reasons is because it provides access to deep soil water in these regional climate sim simulations and therefore increases the soil memory. And so, you know, we're currently doing additional years of simulations here. We're, we're, we're focusing on 2012, 13, and 14 because it's a dry, normal, and wet year over this region. And we're also adding in some one kilometer simulations. So, you know, what, at what point does this scale dependence uh, disappear or, you know, do we start freezing everything in the central U.S., you know, when you start uh, increasing the effect. Uh, and so, you know, also, I didn't show a lot of, of why for these last simulations, primarily because we need to do some more verification and analysis, especially for flux towers and some soil moisture. So that's it.